I want us to look, we've been in a, started a series of messages we're going to be teaching over the next few weeks called Next. And in Next, we are navigating extraordinary times. We live in an extraordinary day. We live in an unusual season, and God is showing us how to navigate, how to get from where we are to where he's taking us. And that's what this series is about as we start this year. And it's easy, you know, after we come in, we've gone through the new year, we're very excited. It's like, woohoo, we're looking forward, we're setting goals, we're resetting for the year. It's easy to fall into what I like to call the February Fitness Club Syndrome, right? That's where we make all the goals to go to the gym and lose weight, and then by February, we're just paying for the gym membership, but we're not actually going anymore, right? Kind of dwindles off a little bit. How many know that can happen in every area of our life? That same center, we can kind of get excited, we can get pumped up, and then it can kind of, our passion and our resolutions can kind of slip back into this routine. And then we find ourselves not really very much farther this year than we were last year. And it's kind of pretty much the same. And, and you know, I just want to see something we've never seen before. And I believe that God has some awesome things for us this year. And he spoke to us in the new year that this was going to be the year of who remembers what it's going to be the year of the year of increase come on everybody shout increase it's the year of increase for you and i believe if it's a year of increase how many know if i'm going to have increase there's got to be some things changing in my life if you're going to have increase there's got to be some things changing in your life And so God is bringing us into what's next, and we don't want to lose sight of what's next. We want June, I want by June to be more excited about this year than I am in January. And that's important. It's easy to lose our navigation when we're navigating the extraordinary times. And it's easy to see that God is speaking to us. And he's wanting to connect with us. And it was interesting. Chuck came over to me during the worship and he was talking. He said, I heard uh, the Lord speak to me when Peter was with Jesus. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, who do you say that I am? And what God wants to do is he wants to show you who he is. Who is Jesus for you this year? What promises, what things are ahead, what in connection to your relationship with God does he have for you? This is so important, and I'm going to be giving you some stuff along that today. Because I want to take kind of an inventory of our own spiritual condition today. And I want this particular service to be a launching pad, kind of the fuel, because to get you from where you are into what's next... Today is about how God does that. And there is a key factor in getting us from where we are to the place where God has us going. So I want to re-examine what it means to have faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. And it sounds like the most simple and most obvious thing in the world, but Jesus said when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? That's the question. And it's easy, even as Christian people, having faith in the sense of our salvation, having faith in the sense of the Bible, in the sense of the message of the gospel, to really kind of disconnect from faith in who he is. Come on, who do you say that he is today? It's easy. Now, if you want to measure your faith in God personally, If you want to see how much faith you have in God, here's what I want you to do. Ask yourself this. How do you use your time every week? How do you use your money every week? How do you navigate your relationships? How do you take advantage of opportunities? How do you see your material possessions? How do you process your gifts, your talents, your abilities? The answers to those questions are going to open the door to let you see your own level of faith. Because if the majority of those answers are centered around what I do in my own ability, 
what I've worked hard to accomplish, and there's nothing wrong with working hard or accomplishing. But if the center of how I answer those questions is all about that, rather than what God is doing in my life in those areas, you see, there's a shift or what God is challenging me for in those areas. It's a difference. It's, it's a measurement that says, is this really a me-centric world that I'm living in right now? Or is this a Jesus-centric world that I'm living in, in terms of our own personal life? It'll tell you how spiritually rooted you are. And the church as a whole can seem flat. Amen? Not this church today. Amen? We're not flat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But how many know you go into the church and you look and it's as dry as last year's bird nest? You look at it, it's so, so non-impacting. I mean, it's there and we thank God for the church because I think the church on its worst day is still the best thing going. But the church is called by Jesus for a purpose. In 2015, we have a reason for being here. And when you look across the board and you see the flatness of the church, what you might come to find out is this. If you read the statistics, only one out of four people who profess Christ, who profess to be Christians, attend church more than once a year. How many of you have already attended church more than once this year? If you came last Sunday and this Sunday, you have. Amen? See, you're already in the top 25% of all Christians right there just by, because you came more than once this year. And that once is usually on Easter, amen, or something like that. But here's the thing. And I thank God for once, but how many know a church can't be powerful on once a year? A church can't be powerful on every other Sunday. There has to be something about understanding who we are as the body of Christ, why it's important to come together, have moments like we had today in worship, see each other, hug each other, build the relationships, see these kind of things happen. It's powerful. Statistics will tell you that if you look at the whole gamut of everyone who calls themselves Christians, only 4% of Christians tithe out of their money, give 10% to the Lord or to the work of the Lord. 4%. Now, if you go into evangelical, on fire people that are really committed to God Christians, you're up to 9%. Not even 10%. Tithe 10%. You know what that says? Here's what that says. That doesn't say something about money and offering. That says something about our trust in God. That says something about our faith. So what I'm telling you this for isn't to make you feel guilty about money or to, or to say we're going to receive a second offering. No, what I'm telling you this for is say, let's look at where our faith is in God this year. Come on, say next. You want to go into what's next? We have to examine and go beyond where we've been before. Right? Right? There is a direct correlation between how we use what God has given us and our spiritual condition. How we utilize the gifts and resources and abilities that God has put in our life, how we use that is directly related to our spiritual condition. It's directly related to our faith. Right? Even our vision here at Jubilee as a church is directly connected to how we use the resources that God has given to us. So it's all about how we commit our time, how we commit our stuff, how we commit ourselves. And you're like, well, you know, well, well, I have to go to work, I have to do this. Yes, you do. All of those things are part of life. And guess what? God wants to be at the center of how all those things work in your life. That's how you get there. So this brings us to this key point that I'm going to call absolute trust in God. Absolute trust is the doorway that gets you from where you are to where you're going to be. We can't even talk about, I don't even want to lay out vision. I don't want to talk about what God is saying to us as leaders for this year until we get this down. This idea of trusting in God. God. And with that in mind, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Right? It's all about the centric nature of who God is. It's all about trusting in Him. Right? Because if we're going to be the church that God is calling us to be, 
we have to be willing not to just give some of ourselves. We have to be willing to not just give 10% of ourselves. But we have to be willing to give all of ourselves. That's actually Christianity. It just so happens that the God we're here worshiping today, that the Lord we have faith in, he's an all or nothing God. Right? I mean, I didn't say it. Jesus said, he said, unless you leave everything and follow me, you can't be a disciple. This is, that, this is the nature of the God we serve. Well, that's kind of scary, Pastor Lynn. Well, guess what? We serve a scary God. And let me tell you, he is awesome and powerful. And he's the reason you get to take the next breath you take. And when we understand that and how big he is, you know what? It makes it a lot easier for us to put our trust in him. And this is how you get from where you are into the next place. Do you want to be blessed this year? This is how blessing comes to you this year. Do you want to increase this year? This is how increase comes this year. It comes from a trust relationship with God. So Paul understood this, and I want to preach to you out of maybe one of my favorite segments of Scripture right here in Romans chapter 12. And I've, I've preached these verses so many times, and I believe that they hold such a powerful key in so many levels to who we are. Look at the demands of the Christian life. In the New Testament, according to Paul, where he wrote in Romans 12 and verse 1, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, when he says that word beseech, that word means I beg you. The word means to beg for. He's like, I'm pleading, I'm begging with you, please, by God's mercy, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. If you underline things in your Bible, I would underline the words living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, there's some pretty heavy stuff in that passage. He's like, I'm begging you because, and if you read the, uh, the pre-verses to that in, in chapter 11, you see the nature of God. He stops and he goes into this, this doxology of the nature of God and how huge God is. And he said, because of this, therefore, I beg you by God's mercy. How many know you can't accomplish what God wants you to accomplish just in your own strength and willpower? You need God's mercy. Amen. By his mercy that you present your body a living sacrifice. Or according to his mercy. Paul says that stewards of God will offer themselves. And he actually refers their bodies. And we could talk for an hour about this, what this word body means. But the main idea is that it means all of yourself or that your total self. It's the idea of an interconnected whole. How many know when we offer ourselves according to the church and where God is taking us and when you offer yourselves personally, it has to do with you and your connections and your relationship and your relationship with God. Everything in the kingdom of God is interconnected. There is nothing singular in the kingdom of God. Everything is plural. Everything is built around relationship. Even God himself is a relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, representing himself to us as a unified plurality, and we are created in his image. So our relationships are very important, right? This is so, so important. And so we are to take our body, our life, every part connected to us, and offer it, he said, as a living sacrifice, now, the idea of a living sacrifice to a Jew in the day that Paul wrote this would have been confusing, right? It would have been an unusual idea because the Jews had only offered a dead sacrifice. That's, that's what they did. Each year, in order to atone for their sin, the people would bring an animal to the priest, the priest would kill it, and they would take that dead sacrifice and offer its death in place of their own to temporarily cover their sin. This was the act. That's why they did those sacrifices. The dead sacrifice would stand as a temporary payment. 
But it didn't stay that way forever because Jesus came, he became a man, and he became the ultimate sacrifice, dying in our place. Right? Because sin produces death in the end result. What God did that was so amazing and what the gospel is all about is that Jesus came and he took our death on himself and died in us and exchanged and gave us his life. It's called the divine exchange and everything that goes with that. And that is the core. That is the heart of the gospel message. And this is absolutely powerful when we understand what God has done for us. So Jesus then offered himself as the perfect final sacrifice to forever forgive all the sin of man for everyone that would believe on him by faith. And because he died for our sins... As the final substitute, there was no longer any more need for dead animal sacrifices. He became that. And Paul said, in view of this, in view of the mercy of God, in view of what Jesus did, that he died, took our death off of us, and gave us life. He said, in view of that merciful stretch of the hand of God, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. In other words, a response to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, Paul says the Christian should give his life back to God as a living sacrifice. Now, there are some Christians and segments of Christianity that feel like it is more spiritual if we can suffer like Jesus, and that makes God happy. But how many know Jesus suffered as a substitute so we don't have to? Jesus died so you don't have to. Jesus took stuff on him so you can be blessed and have life and have strength and have health by his stripes. You are healed. Every part of you, life and strength is yours through Christ. Right? It isn't. It already was. Jesus took care of it on the cross. That's very powerful just by itself. But the problem is that we sometimes still offer God, a dead sacrifice. We do. You know what a dead sacrifice is? A dead sacrifice is when we offer something to God or we sacrifice something to God, but it's disconnected from our heart. We do it because we're supposed to do it, right? But our heart is not the passion of it. Our heart isn't offering itself. There's a disconnect in my relationship with God. Religion is always man trying to please God outside of a relationship with God. Anything like that is always religious in an expression, and it never pleases God. Because God's after one thing, a relationship. He wants your heart more than anything. This is what God, so everything we offer can't come out of a dead sacrifice. It's like when we come to church, right? I do what I'm supposed to do, but my heart isn't in it, right? But if I do it and and it's what I'm supposed to do, well, I'll make God happy because I showed up. But listen, it's a dead sacrifice, It is important to show up each week, and it's important to be where God wants you to be, even if you don't feel like being there, right? But if it's disconnected from our motive for relationship with God, it's a dead sacrifice. It's a dead sacrifice. The same is true of our money and our resources. And this is so important. If all we do is contribute our money or give because, well, uh, we need to do this for the church or, or we need to help the missionaries or, or we need to take care of these things or we need to do this because God asked us to do it. All of those are appropriate. But if it's disconnected from my heart to know that what God wants me to give is so he can have a relationship with me, it's a dead sacrifice. Even in doing right things, we can still offer a dead sacrifice. How many know that God doesn't need anything? Do you know that God doesn't need one penny of your money? He has, in fact, it's not even yours anyway, it's his. Everything you have, the hands you earned it with are his hands. Everything you have is his. It's not even yours anyway, right? God, it's not like God needs something. So why do we give? We give as an act of trust and faith, recognizing that it's God's. 
right? When I give, I'm giving back to God saying, God, I recognize that it's not me who makes this happen. It's you who makes this happen. And what does that do? That's relationship. God, I'm dependent on you for my life and my sustenance. That's why God works through prayer, right? That's why we seek God out of prayer. Is it because God doesn't already know what's going on? God knows exactly what's going on. But God wants you to have a relationship with him. So when we come and ask in prayer, it's relational. And God responds out of the relationship. Come on, good and bad things happen to everybody. You can get mad at God because it's not good enough for you right now. Or you can be happy because it's super good right now. Either way, that's really not the point. God's really not that concerned with it. If I have to be honest, he's concerned about one, one thing. Whether it's going bad or whether it's going good, are you finding God in it? Are you finding out who God is? He desperately wants that relationship with you. That's the living sacrifice. He wants us to live and to give out of the overflow of his life that's inside of us. It's absolutely powerful, right? He wants us to live and give and serve out of this deep desire. And a living sacrifice is much more than just giving 10% or meeting a quota of church attendance. Or reading through a Bible plan, and we have some great Bible plans. We talked about how important it is to make His Word a part of your daily life this year. We talked about that last time when we give you some Bible plans. Those are tools, but listen, it's not just walking through the Bible plan and yay, I did it and God's happy. That's about me. God wants it to be about Him. I'm hungry, God, for your Word. I can read three words in His Bible today, and I could get so much out of Him in those three words, more than I could reading three chapters. It's about how you do it, not what you do. You see, it's about how you give. People get all up in arms because, well, the church is always talking about money. It's about our stuff. Can I tell you why that happens and why it kind of affects us? Because Jesus knows that our stuff is very, very, very precious to us. Very precious. And he's wanting us to make him very precious. And so in the word of God, we have the wonderful treasure of 38 of Jesus' parables that he taught. You can read in the Bible. Do you know out of those 38 parables, 19 of those parables are about your money? Did you know that? So guess who talked about money before we did? Jesus did. Do you know that the Bible talks a lot more about how we handle our money and how we trust God with our money than it does any other single spiritual principle? Even baptism. It talks more about that. You know why? Because our possessions are very precious to us and God wants to stay first in our life. And this is so important because if we miss this, we will stay stuck right here. Trying, striving, hoping, trying not to lose out, whatever the case, we'll get stuck and not push forward into what God calls us to do. I want us to go into what's next. So let's look at ourselves and say, God, what is it inside of me that I'm still trying to hold on to and I'm not letting go and trusting you with? What is it that I am not okay of being without, if necessary, so that I could have you? What is it? God wants a living sacrifice. Amen? He wants us to live and he wants us to give out of overflow, out of that deep desire, right? So a living sacrifice is an offering of ourselves that doesn't flow out of an obligation we have, but flows out of a life that we have. Something that flows out of a relationship that we have. And this has everything to do with getting us where we're supposed to go. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, the problem is a lot of people don't offer themselves as living sacrifice because they're not feeling it. But true faith is not about how I feel. Sometimes true faith is in spite of how I feel. Right. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to transform the way we think about ourselves and about God. But true faith always has as its goal relationship. It always has as its goal the passion to become closer and know God more. 
True faith is initiated out of obeying God's will, even when we don't feel like it. Verse 2 of Romans 12, it says, And be not conformed, or do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. This is so important to understand. Because the Bible says, don't be conformed to the way the world works and thinks. The Bible says, don't be conformed to the way the world works and thinks. You see, when you're conformed to the way the world works and thinks, it becomes very humanistic, it becomes very limited, and it deforms the way you think and see and perceive everything. And if something is deformed, it needs to be transformed, right? So God says, transform, because there's things that you have seen with your eyes, thought about, done with your mind, things that have happened to you that has messed up what's up here. So God says, let my word come and transform you. And that, so that you don't get stuck in being conformed. So Paul says, notice, nothing does Paul say in this passage about living sacrifice. Uh, he doesn't talk at all about feelings. He doesn't say that. He says, well, you know, as God strengthens you, do this. Or, you know, as you are able, do this. No, he just says, do it. Offer this. It's just your reasonable service. Right? It's just your reasonable service. This is who God wants us to be. Now, the translation I'm using uh, calls this living sacrifice your reasonable service back in verse 1. But in the NIV, it uses another term. It calls it your spiritual act of worship. Right? So in one translation, it's just calling it's just what's reasonable. It's what's logical. To offer this, to respond to Jesus in this way, is just your reasonable act of service. It's just your choice. But in another translation, it says this is actually a spiritual act of worship to God when you do this. Now, here's the thing. That passage could be translated both ways accurately. And some people have said Paul actually meant it both ways when he wrote it. Being a living sacrifice is both a spiritual act of my worship and a reasonable response to God in light of what he's done. So if we're going to be good stewards of God, right, we can't just wait for when we feel like it, right? There's one song, it's a good song. I mean, I like it. it it's an older song. It says, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Has anybody ever heard that song? It's like an old song. But listen, if only time I ever prayed is every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, how many know I could go long extensions without praying sometimes? It's not just about what we feel like. Right? If we're going to experience the fires of revival, if we're going to experience the passionate power of the Holy Spirit coming into our generation, not just in momentary meetings, but on a daily experience of life in ways that transform cities and touch nations, here's what it has to happen. We have to be worried less about feeling and acting more out of obedience to God. So what's next? What's next is we're going to do more and worry about how we feel about it less. Amen? That's what's next. We're going to do more this year and worry about how I feel about it less. Because I can't rely on my feelings. If I rely on my feelings, my living sacrifice isn't going to live very long. Right? Because my feelings will go up and down based on how I'm tired, based on what I ate, based on what somebody said to me based on how work went today. Come on, all of that stuff just bounces us around. So we can't do that. We have to understand it's out of obedience with what we have. I, I read a story a long time ago when Mother Teresa was still alive. She did a visit to Australia. And when she got there, there was a new recruit to the monastery in Australia that was assigned to be her guide and assistant during her stay, this young man was 
very excited about the opportunity not only to meet Mother Teresa, but to be in close proximity to her. Uh, he thought about what he was going to ask her, maybe what, what they could talk about, what he could learn from her. But during her visit, he became very frustrated because her schedule was so tight and so busy. Even though he was constantly next to her, he never even had an opportunity to say one word to her because there were always other people and other things going on. And so finally, as the tour came to the end, she was due to fly to New Guinea from Australia. And in desperation, the young man had finally one moment to speak to Mother Teresa. And he says, Mother Teresa, I have a question. If I pay my own airfare to New Guinea, can I sit next to you on the plane so that I can talk to you and so that I can learn from you? And so Mother Teresa looked at him and she asked him this question. She said, so do you have enough money to pay your airfare to New Guinea? And he said, yes, I do. And, and I'm ready to go and invest it. And she says, well, then use that money and give it to help somebody and obey God. She said, you'll learn more from that than anything I'll tell you on an airplane. How many know God wants us to learn from doing? We don't have to learn and then do. We learn as we do and grow. The problem is the young man wanted to experience a feeling when what he needed to do was learn by doing. By doing, it would transform his thinking. And by transforming his thinking, he could experience an inward change that would affect everything else around him. We are the same way. We have to understand the same thing. We have this idea that if I could get this knowledge or if I could learn this or if I could just ask this question or if I could do this, it would change everything. When what God is saying, hey, I want you to act. I want you to do this. And by doing this, it's going to change you inside. And from your inside change, it's going to affect everything around you on the outside. This is how it works. It has everything to do with with absolute trust. That is the key to getting into the next of your life and purpose. Trusting God. Not only trusting God, but God trusting you. And I want to talk about both sides of that coin for just a moment. I remember as a kid, a simple song we would sing in church called Trust and Obey. How many here are old enough to remember that song besides me? A very few hands. The song is very similar. It went like this. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Very simple song, powerful message powerful message because trust and obey there is no other way to get where God is taking you this is so important well Proverbs 3 you can turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 3 it talks a lot about trust in regard to pressing forward to what's next in our lives and purposes we're learning to navigate these extraordinary times. So if you have a pen, I want you to get it ready because I'm going to very quickly give you five keys out of this passage about how to discover your next in God this year. How to discover. I don't want to talk about the what yet. I want to talk about the how first. And this is the how that God is giving to us from this important passage of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to read the first few verses. There are five keys here. And I'm just going to read these verses. My son, do not forget my law. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about this passage is through these verses, what you have is the heart of a father instructing his son with key life lessons for his son's success. Now, keep that in mind as we read. Do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Pause there for a minute. 
How many besides me want to have favor and high esteem with God and with man this year? This tells you how to do it. This tells you exactly how to have that. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Do you want to have God directing your path this year? Your choices, your decisions. Verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. How many want to have health and strength this year? Amen. It's directly related to what this instruction is. Verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of all, and there's my word, your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. How many want to have a full barn and an overflowing vat this year? Amen. I do too. So I'm going to give you these five quick keys. Number one, walk in complete obedience. Walk in complete obedience. It says, my son, don't forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. So as this instruction begins, he's talking first about complete obedience. What is the result of obedience? You read it in verse 2. Length of days, long life, and peace. In other words, if you obey the teaching and instruction of God completely, it will open the door for a long and prosperous life. How many know you can have a prosperous life that's cut off quickly and very short and it's not that enjoyable? Or you can have a long life that's miserable and not prosperous and that's not very enjoyable. But how many know if your life is long and prosperous? Amen? Sounds like Star Trek, right? Live long and prosper. Here's the thing. That idea comes from this verse. And it starts by walking in complete obedience to God. Number two, second key to getting into your next this year. Surround yourself with mercy and truth. Surround yourself with mercy and truth. It says, don't let mercy and truth forsake you. He said, bind them around your neck. And write them on the tablet of your heart. He talks about mercy and truth being central to every part of your life. This is important because mercy and truth work together. How many know you can love truth and miss out on mercy? And if you just have truth without mercy, you're going to be in a bad place. And your life isn't going to be very much fun. I'm just telling you that right now. A lot of Christians are like that. They love truth, but they forget mercy. There are other Christians who are mercy, 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 and they leave truth out. Right? Mercy and truth are married, and they walk together. And if you want to be fulfilled in your life this year, you bind around your life mercy and truth. That means mercy needs to be extended out of you. Truth needs to be coming out of you. Everything you do needs to be built around mercy and truth. The result of that is that both God and others will favor you and will consider you a success. That God himself will favor you and esteem you. And that men will favor you and esteem you. Why? Because God's nature is mercy and truth. And you're representing him. How do you represent God? Mercy and truth. A lot of times we like to receive mercy, but we're not very quick to extend mercy. But if you have an account, you've got to sow into the account before you can withdraw from the account. If any of you have been to an ATM before, you might have experienced that truth, right? In this sense, you have to invest into mercy so you can draw from mercy. And you know what? If I'm going to make an error... I would rather err in being too merciful than not merciful enough. Because there may come a day where I need to receive some mercy. Right? Mercy and truth, it'll bring favor with God and favor with man. This is a huge key. 
Number three, trust absolutely without holding anything back, complete and total trust. Trust begins by a realization. The realization is that God is completely in control of everything. Every breath you breathe, life itself. Yes, we live in a broken world. Yes, bad things happen. And yeah, the same God that wants you into your next, you have a devil that's trying to stop you from being in your next. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But within that framework, you have to understand this. Life only continues because God allows it to. And this is huge to understand. That means you have to trust him absolutely. It says trust in the Lord with most of your heart. No, it doesn't say that. So you're like, what? I don't think it says that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Come on, both of these verses have an all in them. I would underline that word all or put a big circle around it. Trust in the Lord with all. All your heart, all your internal decisions, all your convictions, all your passions. Put all of that in trust with God. And lean not on your own understanding. That means God's smarter than we are. So trust Him. In some of your ways, no? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And he will direct your path in all of your ways. That's all of your outward actions, all of your obedience. So what it means is trust inwardly results in outward success. When we're obedient, outward obedience. So if we do these things, God promises us to give us divine direction and guidance. Guess what? If you want to take the pilot seat, God will let you. If you want to take the wheel, God will let you have it. But if you want to be smart, take your hands off and trust in the Lord with all your heart. And he will direct your paths. Here's the key, though. God's direction may be different than your direction. But you have to trust in him. But God's going to give you clarity on your road for this year to follow. Trust absolutely. Number four, fear the Lord and run from evil. Fear the Lord and run from evil. Verse seven says for us not to be wise in what we can see naturally, but to live in the fear of God and to run away from evil. It says, don't be wise in your own eyes. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I understand faith in God. And I, I believe in God and everything. But you've got to use wisdom too. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible does say to use wisdom. Wisdom is a huge value in the Bible. But the Bible says not to be wise in your eyes. But to fear God. The wisest thing that you can be. And Proverbs says it just a couple of chapters before. It says... The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why? Because whatever it is that you're afraid of will have the control in your life. And there's only one thing that you need to be afraid of, and that's God. Pastor Lynn, I don't know if we should be afraid of God. Let me tell you, God is huge and powerful, and your life is held in his grip. He is fearful, awesome, and yes, you should be. But the other side of that is that God loves you. And he is passionately involved in having a relationship with you. That's huge. Fear God and run from evil. When you do that, you will make wise decisions this year. God will lead you in right decisions. You'll be able to look at something and immediately determine this is yes or no for me. Because I fear the Lord, right? And run from evil, right? According to this verse, fearing God is the key to being healthy and strong. It says when you walk in the wisdom that comes out of the fear of the Lord, that wisdom will make you healthy and strong. Why? Wisdom changes how you think. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but your thinking is directly connected to your physical body. Do you know that your thinking is connected to your health? 
Your brain is a part of your body. You know, they all work together and function interdependently. And you know how you think what happens in your psyche can determine how healthy you are. And if you are feeding yourself with negative stuff, if you're feeding yourself with ungodly stuff that's full of death and destruction, you know what? It is going to have a play out on your physical body. But when you fear the Lord, you'll walk in health and your bones will be strong. Amen. How many want strong bones? Amen. Hallelujah. Number five. Honor the Lord with your possessions and increase. Honor the Lord with your possessions and increase. Verse nine tells us how we honor God. We honor him by giving him our resources, our possessions. Why? goes back to what we were saying earlier because our possessions are very precious to us and our possessions can easily take value over God in our life if we allow them to now we don't like to admit that but they it can happen how many know possessions don't just come in terms of cars and and houses and cell phones how many know possessions can be our children the things that God has. Nothing can take the place of God. And if you will honor God with your possessions, here's what will happen. God will entrust you for increase. Do you want this to be the year of increase for you? Honor the Lord. How do you honor God? Honor Him with what you have. Giving your time. Giving your life. Giving your stuff for the purpose of His glory. To serve him. And when you do, God's going to see that relationship developing between you and him. And he's going to say, man, I can just dump all kinds of more stuff on them. Because out of their increase, it brings more honor. Out of their stuff, it's bringing us close together. This is powerful stuff, guys. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Give him out of your increase. When God increases you this year... You make your first priority out of the increase to honor God with that. And you know what it says? It says that your barns will be full. Now, this was an agricultural society. So today, your barns are the places where you have storage and things for your sustenance. It's your bank accounts. It's the things that you have that pertain to life. It's the things that you need in order to walk out the purposes of God. That will be full. Do you want that to be full this year? And it talks about your vats. This was also a place where wine was one of the main sources of nourishment and drink. And when they would have a harvest of grapes, there were dry years and there were plentiful years. And on the dry years, you would squeeze out all those grapes because it's not just how many grapes you had, but it was how full and juicy those grapes were, right? And on a dry year, you'd only get about half a vat full of juice. But on a good year, your vats could not hold the amount of juice that would come for you that year. How many want that to be your year 2015? Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. So there they are. Walk in complete obedience. Surround yourself with mercy and truth. Fear the Lord and run from evil. I mean, I mistrust, trust absolutely. Fear the Lord and run from evil. Honor the Lord with your possessions and increase. This will get you to the next. Listen, we can stop right here and not say anything. If you can get this, if you can get what I'm saying, it will do more in this one short message than a whole weekend seminar of self-help that you pay $200 to go to. This is the key to life. This is the key to joy. This is the key to prosperity and success. This is the key in life. And it has nothing to do with the tangible stuff. It has everything to do with your relationship with God who created you, who calls you. Right? These commands are all inclusive. There's no exceptions. Right? He didn't ever say it's okay for some people to partially obey. But God, you don't know how it is. You don't understand how hard it is for me, right? He didn't say with most of our heart to trust in him. He didn't say we could be successful by sometimes allowing him to lead and guide us. 
No, the words he uses are all-inclusive. Like we said earlier in the message, he is an all-or-nothing God. No exceptions, no leaks. He says, I want you to understand that trust is a total connection of your heart to my heart. And that's what he's after. Every command reveals a picture of a promise on the other side. Everything God wants us to do is connected to a promise. Why? Because to God, it's relational. It's not about good stuff or bad stuff or how rich or how poor you are. It's about how much do you know me? And I'm thankful to be blessed and I'm thankful to have stuff. But whether I have it or whether I don't have it, it's really not that big of a deal. I know you might think it is. It's really not that big of a deal. But the question is, how much do I know God in it? How much do I know him? If we trust him completely, if we obey him completely, he has some wonderful provisions for us as his children. And it's easy to say, yeah, I trust God. I trust God. But do I really? Is God really my source? Is he really central to everything? And this brings us to an incredible question that I'm going to ask. And I'm going to turn the tables for just a moment. And then we're coming to an end of this message. I've come to the conclusion that the key to successfully living in what's next for you has everything to do with trusting God. It's easy to preach from up here. It's another thing to live it out. But just when we're about to focus on this issue on how well we trust God, I'm going to turn the tables around and ask you another question. Can God trust you? Does God find you trustworthy? Am I a trustworthy person before God? Can God give me what he desires to knowing that he can trust me with what he has. And when I say trust, it's not that I'm going to be careful with what he gives me. It's not that I'm going to increase it. And, and that those are principles at play. But the principle he's saying, can I trust you with my relationship with you? Or am I going to bless you and you're going to forget me? This is the key thing. Right? God says, I can't touch this area of your life yet because you haven't grown to that level of trust. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I have a car. And I'm sure if I were to give her the keys and say, you know what, you want to go take this car for a spin? And she really knew I was serious and that I had the opportunity, she'd probably take me up on it. But you know what, I'm not going to give her the keys to my car because she has not achieved that level of responsibility and trustworthiness yet in her age. Right? Does that mean I'm withholding from my daughter? No. Does that mean I'm being mean and I'm not answering her prayers even if she really wants to drive my car? No. None of that's true. It means I'm doing what's best for her and what's best for my relationship with her. It means that one day as she grows into that trust and responsibility, she can get the keys to the car and drive it. You see, when you pull it from that perspective, it changes how we see God. Because we see it from the 10-year-old with a car key wondering why we can't drive the car. Because we think we've got this thing because we did it on video games before. Listen, it doesn't just work that way. God sees it from a different perspective. So what we want to do, do you see how this applies to what's next? What we want to do this year is to grow in our trust relationship so that God can bring us an increase. So that God can show us the next step on our path. So we don't get stuck in baby steps, but we can take bigger strides in faith with him. This is my challenge for you today. Let me tell you, when we trust God, there's two levels of trust. Number one, you have to trust him in your adversity. Because you can't just trust God when things are going good. You have to trust him in difficulty as well. And you have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit to help you do that. David said in Psalm 56, 4, he said, For in God I trust, I will not be afraid. Nothing. Another place he said, What can man do to me? 
In Psalm 34, he said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. I believe there's deliverance from fear for some of you today. Things that you're concerned and fearful of coming this year. Listen, there's deliverance for you today. Because God wants you to trust him in adversity. When things are a little bit scary. When things aren't going exactly right. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? This is so important. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Why? Because God's the author of life anyway. Here's where the conflict comes. Here's our problem. God asks us to obey or trust him in an area of our life that's bigger than what we can understand. It's bigger than what we can figure out. We can't wrap our head around it. We know, yeah, it's possible. I believe God may be saying, but I don't understand how this is going to happen because I just, it, it, I'm not in a good place for this. It's, it's, it's not going to work for me, right? And so instead of acting and doing our part in total trust and obedience, instead of stepping out where God says to do it, we enter a negotiation with God. Have you ever negotiated with God? <laughs> I have a few times. God always wins those things. Just so you know, he always does. But we start if then in God. Now, God, if I do this, then how are you going to fix this? God, if I do this for you, then could you do this for me? God, if, if I'll sacrifice this, then will you help me here, right? Lord, if, if I really let you have my marriage, then, then what are you going to do with my spouse? Right? It's like we're trying to explain things to God that he doesn't get. It's kind of funny when you think about it, right? Well, if I surrender this offering to you, God, then, then what are you going to do for my finances? Or what if I give and nothing happens? Or what if I give and it gets worse? How many know it's not about amounts? It's not about paying for it. It's about a relationship. This is important for you to understand. Well, God, I'm not sure you really understand how bad the economy is. You've got to understand, God, I, I'm not there yet. I'm not ready for this yet. I'm not really sure, God. This is why Jesus said we have to be like little children when we come into the kingdom of heaven. We have to be like children to get in heaven because the simplicity of a child to a parent, the willingness to be vulnerable, the willingness to just say yes to God and trust him, not knowing what's going to happen, where we're going, not being able to fully take care of yourself, but having to fully rely on on mom and dad to take care of you as a child. Do you, do you see where this is going? This is what Jesus said. This is, the, this is how we have to come in. It's this kind of trust. It's this kind of faith. Right? And the older we get, the wiser we get in our own eyes and we can lose sight of our faith. But the more we grow in our relationship with God, the more we grow in our faith. Right? It's not a double standard. When, when David said, listen, Lord, I, I, I believe and trust in you. Help me with my fears. Right? It's not a double standard for that. What it is, is a willingness to trust God. I believe you. God, help my unbelief. God knows your weaknesses. He knows your frame, the Bible says. He already knows all that stuff. He just wants a relationship. Try it. Try it. And the other side of that coin trusting him in adversity, you have to also trust him in plenty. Because the blessing of God also becomes a test for your heart. Because it's easy to forget God when you come into blessing. To the extent which we genuinely thank God for blessings that he provides is an indicator of our trust in him. This becomes difficult because when we're blessed, there's a tendency for us to either exalt ourselves or trust in our blessings. It's a much bigger test to trust God in blessings than it is in lack. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. I know some of you are thinking, well, I'd like that test. But listen to me. We run to God so fast when we have problems. But then we often ignore God when we're blessed. Because there's a tendency to think, you know, I'm doing pretty good here. And we become self-reliant. It's so human. But the point of trust is that God is our source. It's human tendency 
to trust God's instruments of provision and not trust God himself. We trust the job instead of realizing that God is the provider of the job. And we get afraid we're going to lose our job instead of realizing that God could just as easily put us in a better job at any moment. He's God. It's about trusting in Him. It's about that relationship. We trust in our health and our strength instead of living in the realization that God is the provider of our health and strength. And We can work and we can strive and we can do whatever we want to do, but in the end, God is the provider of it. And we have to be stewards of what He gives us in terms of those things, our health, our strength, our job, our children, all of those things, we're stewards. We have to be wise and careful, but we have to understand that God is the center and he's where we put our trust. This final verse, Proverbs 18, you don't have to turn there, but it says this in verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his own esteem. Now, this isn't talking about what you have. This is talking about your perception, your worldview. The thing that we have that gets in the way, the thing that we have that can become a high wall, the thing that we put our confidence in, Here's my question for you as we're closing today. What is your high wall? What is your unscalable obstacle? What is the thing that you can't live without? What is the thing that you're afraid of losing more than anything else? Is it a relationship? Is it what's in your bank account? Is it your job? Is it your health? Is it your education? What is your unscalable wall what is standing between where you are now and where God wants you to be it's so easy for us to trust all these other things and not make God the platform of our trust one man told me God it just seems like I can't grow in my faith and and my relationship with the Lord it's because you never put your total weight on Him. You're still struggling to stand in your own strength. Relax. Let go. Jesus said, if you try to save your life, God, I can't let go of this. God, I don't want to lose this. God, please, 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 please. You'll lose it. But he who's willing to lose his life for my sake, will find it. He's the creator of life. This is such an important principle for you. I want you to close your eyes with me. Where are you today in your trust relationship with God? Where is your faith today? We could all go higher and do better. We could all strive more and we can all find the same cycles of trying harder and not doing as well as we had hoped. But today I want to pull you out of all of that capability thinking and I want to put you in a relational thinking. God wants to pull you today out of the natural realm of how you see things and He wants you to see you through His eyes. And today he wants to show you what's ahead of you on your path. Today he wants to show you what your next step is. I'm going to ask everyone to stand to your feet with me. There's a, a hymn. It's probably one of my favorite hymns. And it simply says this. Tis so sweet. To trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, 
just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust how I proved him Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Come on, lift your hands high and sing it again. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. How I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to your hands still lifted. Lord, I thank you right now for a shower, a waterfall of grace to begin to fall over this auditorium. Lord, that you would begin to give us grace for trust. Lord, that you would stretch our faith for who you are, God. Lord, that you would do something on the inside of us. Jesus, Lord, I cry out today, Lord, that we would totally fall into your grip, into your hands, God that you would come and make our way very clear this year. Make it clear today. If you're here today and there is a specific area in your life while I was speaking this message that God dealt with you about, if there's something very specific that you need to let go of, Something that has been worrying you, that you've been afraid of, God says, let it go to me. Something that you've been believing for and waiting for that hasn't happened. Whatever that is, it's very specific. If that's you, I want you to come down to the front. We're getting ready to have a trust relationship altar right here. And we're going to let things go. We're going to throw ourselves into the arms of God right now. If I'm talking to you, slip out of your seat. Maybe your heart itself isn't even where it needs to be with God. This is your opportunity to get your heart right with God. Sometimes I just have to give my heart to Him. Sometimes I just have to open up to Him. Right now, what is it that is between you and where God wants you to be? Today, the answer is in trust. Today, the answer is in faith. When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith in the earth? Where do you need faith? What relationship? What situation? What are you believing God for? If that's something that you can identify very specifically, I want you to come down to the front because we're going to pray specifically for you today. Come on, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh. If you're up at the front, I want you to lift your hands right now. And our ministry team is coming. We're going to begin to minister to you. But right now, I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I give you everything. All. I trust you with all my heart. In all my ways, God. Now, you be very specific with him right now. And you tell him why you're here. Very very specifically and as you do I believe God is going to open something on the inside of your heart 
Jesus, I extend my hand to every person that is up here right now. And Lord, I thank you that what you start, Lord, you are faithful to complete. You said he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And so, Lord, I release the grace of God. Lord, for trusting in you, God, that you would stretch us in our relationship, God. Lord, I've been stretched, God. Lord, you've taken me and confronted me, God, in places that I felt were so hard. But, God, I found you in it. And I wouldn't trade those moments. So, Jesus, bring us into that relationship right now. Stretch us in our faith, God. Lord, let us see what we've never seen. And know what we've never known today, Jesus. Precious Jesus, we thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name. We're going to just continue to minister. If you're out at the auditorium, I want you to extend your hands up one more time. And I want you to just say, Lord, I'm giving you my trust. Lord, show me my pathway this year. God is going to give you clarity. He's going to bring blessings into your life today. He's going to bring strength into you today to see what you've never seen. Do you believe that today? Come on, Jesus. I thank you for that. Today, as you walk out of this place, this message is going to go with you. And today, as you walk through today and as you go to work tomorrow, God's going to show you places where you've got to trust Him. You're going to start to say something and God's going to remind you, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Come on, you're going to step into something God's going to show you. Trust in me. Don't lean on to your own understanding. Ask me. He's going to speak to you. I believe you're going to have the clearest vision for this year you've ever had. And we're going to have the most powerful year as a church we've ever had. Do you believe that with me? Come on, I believe that. And I pray God's blessings over you this week. Amen. We're just going to minister to these that are up here. If you're here today and you need special prayer for anything, if you have sickness in your body, We serve the God of a miracle, amen? And He can work a healing. He can heal you. He can perform His Word in your life. Whatever you need Him to do today, 